plants behind me, all of these five here, they are, even this one, are exactly the same species. They are Titan Arum, or, or they should be known as Amorphophallus Titanum. But uh, in the 1980s, David Attenborough, I'm sure you've heard of him, decided that when he was filming The Life of Plants, the BBC Life of Plants, that saying phallus on TV uh, wasn't appropriate in the 80s. So he dropped the name Amorphophallus and replaced it with a uh, Titan Arum, and that has stuck a bit more. But it should be called Amorphophallus Titanum. It's also named as the corpse flower, but we'll discuss why in a moment. The life cycle begins in this stage, this leaf stage here. So when it first comes out of the ground, it's about six inches high. It looks exactly the same as that, just miniaturized. And it will last about 12 to 18 months. After that, the leaves will have got a bit dirty and photosynthesis will have um, dropped off a bit and it will degrade and break down. Then it will go dormant for about three months or so. And then another one of these will come up. Now, botanically, this is a single leaf. So these are all just divisions of one structure, that's one leaf. And each year it grows progressively a bigger leaf. Now, when we get to um, year 10, so eight to 12 years on average, to year 10, let's say, they'll be pretty big. You can see these guys are four meters up, four meters across, giant versions of this. Now, the reason it's done this for 10 years is this is basically a solar farm, zapping the energy of the sun and storing it underground in an underground core, an underground bowl. Now these bulbs, as you can imagine, get pretty big. This was one we had in 2011 that weighed 120 kilograms. They can weigh as much as 20 stone. These are big bulbs. And the reason for the ginormous bulb that's taken 10 years to achieve is so that they can produce a flower for two days. Yes, this just flowers for two days. It's often thought of as the world's largest flower. It's not the world's largest flower. That is another species called Raphalesia. This is the world's largest inflorescence. An inflorescence being a scientific term, meaning lots of flowers acting as a single structure. So a classic example for us is a sunflower. Looks like one flower. Look at it closely. It's lots of little ones. That's what this is, world's largest. You can see all the little individual flowers in the cutaway that we've got down here. Now, not only does it produce a flower for just two nights, or two days, but the flower is also sexed. So on the very first 24 hour period, the first night effectively, it is female. And I say it is female in that it's only then that its stigma is accepting to pollen. The second 24 hours, the plant produces its own pollen from those other male flowers above. So by doing it on separate nights, the flower cannot self-pollinate. So it cannot mix its own genes, it cannot inbreed, which is really good for its genetic makeup. However, what that means is that it relies on another flower existing at the same time. Now I mentioned it was called the corpse flower, and if you can come up close late in a moment, you'll smell that it smells of rotting flesh, putrid rotting flesh, lovely. And the reason it's going for that angle is it's trying to attract a rather unique pollinator. It's trying to attract something called a sweat fly or a carrion beetle. Now, all flies, mostly, want to find a dead piece of meat to lay their eggs on. Their eggs are gonna hatch into maggots and the maggots want to feed on that meat. Now, there's no meat here, this is a plant. But the flies are convinced. They come along, they deep, go deep inside the carcass, or they believe it's the carcass, and they lay their eggs, and their eggs hatch into maggots. But unfortunately, it's not meat. So those maggots all starve to death and die. It's genocide for the fly. It's a tragedy. The fly gets no reward. It gets no nectar, nothing good like a lot of other pollinators got. It gets nothing. Now, this flower, being a tropical plant, grows in the rainforests of Sumatra, a little bit in Borneo. It can flower any day of the year. There is no correct season to flower. There is no good day, wrong day. Every day is the same in the tropical rainforest. So let's just put some of that knowledge together in one, in one little piece, sorry. This plant takes 10 years to produce a flower for two days. A flower that cannot self-pollinate. So this plant has to hope that the two days, any two days, because it's tropics, that it's chosen in 10 years, another flower has chosen the same two days in 10 years to grow. 
but it'd be one day different so that when this is male, that is female and vice versa. Then the plant has to hope that the fly that it is attracted by its putrid smell and is convinced enough to waste its young and lay its maggots to a, a death, picks up some pollen. And then the same fly is then convinced by that other plant to waste its young for a second time, but this time possibly distribute the pollen accidentally and pollinate the plant. It's a pretty uh, extreme system as you can imagine. We think the plant has never been common, <laughs> but it's definitely rare now, not helped by the clearing of the Indonesian rainforest for oil palm. If you do get successful pollination, you get this. So this will all uh, start to collapse after day two and it will all tighten up into a tight bun and it will take about five months for the last of it to break away. And when it does, this is exposed. And when inside we see these fruiting bodies. Now, these little ones on top haven't been pollinated, but these nice swollen ones have. So inside of those is a seed, maybe two. But if I was to pick that and plant it in the ground, it would not grow. Because underneath that red skin, there's a, an orange goo, which acts as a chemical inhibitor, stopping the seed from growing. In nature, these are eaten by a large hornbill, big tropical bird. They swallow them whole. Um, they get the reward of the soft tissues and the seed passes through the digestive tract, stripped of its chemical inhibitor, so that when it's pooped out far away in the rainforest in its own pile of fertilizer, it's good to go. We have to scrub them and brush them down. But we're very excited about these growing, so more so that we've got multiple blooms. Not only is this a once in a 10 year occasion, but we've got multiples. Now, I don't want to humiliate the guy because he's a genius. But this man here is a rather young looking chap. He's the, one of the world's best growers of these. This, his name's Tim, and he, uh, he's worked his whole uh, horticultural career at the Eden Project. And he's one of our homegrown. But he loves these plants, he's obsessed, and he's become one of the best growers in the world. In fact, if you've ever seen these growing anywhere in Europe, it's because Tim has contributed some knowledge to those growers and helped them grow it. But Tim doesn't know everything, because he told us uh, some few months ago that there looks like there may be a gap in the calendar. And that this year, although he's got 40 or 50 leaf stages at various ages off site, we were not going to get a Titan Hour. Well, I'd like to introduce you to number seven, eight, and nine, since he said those famous words, and we've got six more coming. So not only have we broken the, uh, uh, what Tim said, but we've actually smashed the world record. This is more than ever been grown in a 12 month period ever before and we've got more time for more to come. So we've smashed the world record. But the thing that got me really excited personally, and no one else was really on my side, but I'm starting to get them over, is we hoped very much that these two that were close enough together, and we did not know until two days ago, whether they could be one day apart in blooming. Now one day apart would mean, you know, male and female, aye aye, party time. And uh, that's exactly what happened. We have one day apart. Now that means for the first time ever in recorded history, anywhere outside of its native home range of the rainforest of Sumatra, we could have natural pollination. For the first time ever in captivity, a fly, and yes, we do have them in our rainforest biome, could visit this putrid smell, waste its young, and then visit this one and drop off its pollen. And we could have cross-pollinization. We could have a natural fruiting body for the first time ever. Now that's pretty cool in itself. Now, if you want to smell them, then you'll have to get pretty close. They're nighttime active. So if you really want to smell it at its best, I recommend you come back at night. Now, normally that's not an option because our rainforest biome shuts at half five and you can't get in here when they're uh, getting to their best. But for the next three days, tonight, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, med dining is on as it is every week. And if you come in and book yourself a meal in the med dining restaurant, for the first time ever, we're going to open up our tropical rainforests as well. So not only do you get a great meal at night, just for you, the whole, bar, the whole of Eden shut, only for you, uh, night lit and beautiful food, birds singing, it's very beautiful. But you also get to come in here and you will see these petals, they're not petals, but let's just call them petals, open up a lot more. 
so that the gas that's being built up in here, this sulfuric gas, it's quite a heavy gas, and naturally settles, will be lifted up. Because the other really cool thing that these plants do, that we can't see right now, is they generate heat. Most plants don't do that. If you come back here tonight, about midnight, one o'clock in the morning, these guys will peak at 38 degrees Celsius. That's pretty much mammal body temperature. Is that a coincidence? I think not. The flies are convinced. It smells like rotting flesh. It feels like rotting flesh. But also, the other thing that heat does is it will raise up that sulfuric gas, lift it up into the spadex, this structure here, which is basically a giant loofah, and it'll escape through all of the, the holes that are in it, lifted by its own thermal energy up through the canopy to distribute about three kilometers range. If you come back in here in the next three nights, you will smell it the second you walk in the door. Right now, you'll have to stick your head in because it's trying to conserve that gas. It is a real stinker. But if you did come in, you would be able to smell putrid, rotting flesh, which I think smells like a barrel of rotting seafood, shellfish, rotting white fish. Then you could go back into the med dining and have some fish and shell food. Anyway, if anyone's got any questions, let me know. Um, and uh, that's the Titan Arrow thing. Feel free to come and have a sniff and I'll waft it in your face. I love wafting putrid smells in people's faces. I get hate.